The pipeline. Well, the pipeline for long acting, I put a lot of these in, in yellow. In fact, I've, I've just noticed I missed one of them out. But actually, uh, for many of us here, or uh, no, the minority of us, we grew up in an era of HIV with no drugs, one drug class, two drug class, three. And now we've, we've learned most of them like a, like a kid learning a language, right? But for you guys who've come new to the subject, suddenly you've got all of these classes, all of these drugs, and all these things to uh, learn all at once. So I'm going to talk about some of the things in yellow here, about some of the long-acting uh, drugs which are under evaluation. Oh, something's not working, so I'll just keep going until it says... Yeah. Uh, okay, no, it did work. So is there a demand for it? That's the very first thing you should say because it's all right. I mean, say gave a wonderful talk, but if all of that stuff comes out and nobody wants it because they all say, I just take a pill every day, doc. I don't want an injection. But the, the thing is, the lessons are from contraceptive pills where actually the, the more diverse the modality is, the more coverage you'll get of populations because some people will say, I'll take pills, others injectables, and others you can see implantables. So it's really good that we're moving down this way in HIV to give people an advantage. Now, I can't tell you who's the best candidate for a pill, for a long-acting injectable, or for an implant. But that will, I think, with this new technology, we will develop it. And as you know, we've all got in our head an idea of who might take it best. But actually, I've heard a lot of people say, ah, oh, those guys who are chaotic, it'd be great to put an implant in. But if they don't come back after six months, then maybe that's not a good job to put an implant in because uh, the drug levels can go down and maybe they get resistance. So we, we will work that out in the future. But first, we need the compounds. So what are some of the pros and cons for our patients? Well, they could allow monthly dosing or even less, right? So you could out to six months or annual. Uh, so far, we've seen they're tolerated to date, they're more convenient, and also less stigma. I have, uh, there's a minority of our patients who don't like having the drugs at home because other people, relatives, people they share rooms with, people who visit might see the tablets, might find them. If you've got an implant there or you go somewhere for your injection, then it, it can reduce the stigma. Uh, and also it might promote adherence because it's hard not to <laughs> take something that's just been put into your buttock or under your skin. And you can have directly observed therapy because you could, what you can do is you make sure that they do it and you sign it all off. There are some problems. I am injections. Um, there, uh, for those of you who also do sexually transmitted disease or infectious disease and give patients treatment for syphilis, you know that a lot of the patients complain about IM injections. So uh, are they going to be tolerable in the long term? You know, it might be okay for six months, one year. Are people going to maintain their tolerability? And of course, says mentioned about the terminal half-life could be an advantage and it could be a problem. If they can't be self-administered, you imagine in your clinics that you've got to have the patients come every month or every six weeks or every, even every two months. We have nearly 12,000 patients. So if we even had half of those coming that often, we would be overwhelmed. And you've got to ask, who's going to do it, right? <laughs> and of course, you're, you're, if you're a physician here, you'll say, oh, the nurse can do it. But actually, if you're a physician with a uh, few nurses, maybe sometimes it'll be you doing it. So, you know, you've got to ask. And, and obviously, you might say maybe partners can do it, but they have to be taught. Uh, and, and potential for resistance in non-adherent patients is always a problem, whichever mode of delivery. So, say showed this, uh, uh, and basically, I'm going to talk about initially the most advanced in terms of long-acting formulations. And this is cabotegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, and real piverine, a non-nucleoside. And uh, you can see that um, they're also being looked at in PrEP. And uh, with cabotegravir, you have to give it initially orally in case you get any side effects or problems. And this is an issue if you're giving a long-acting that you really need, if unless the drug has absolutely no side effects, and the only one in HIV is probably 3TC you can put in the water, and it won't harm anyone. But actually, um, you really have to be very careful, because if you put something in that's going to be in there for months or weeks, and people get a reaction to it, you have to deal with it. I've always thought, give them rifampicin quick, because uh, you've probably increased the metabolism. 
Okay, so this is some of the clinical data. So this is the carbotegravir data here, uh, given IM and real pivirine. And here is the oral, okay, the oral run-in. And you have cabotegravir and real pivirine uh, was added uh, uh, at week 16, you can see here. These are all naive patients. They've got more than 200 cells, and it's quite a large number. So they're given an oral run-in, and then they go to cabotegravir and real pivirine IM. And this is every four weeks. You have to get used to all this new terminology, Q4W. And this is 600 milligrams and a higher dose of rolpivirine every eight weeks. And then this is just continuing, continuing with the oral, okay? So you can see here, here's all the running with the cabotegravir and then uh, four weeks of rolpivirine to make sure that doesn't cause any problem. And then you get randomized to one of these three arms. And the ejections were two to three mil in the, in the gluteal region. Provider administrated. In other words, you know, the nurses gave it. And here it is. Look at this, fantastic virological outcomes at week 48, and it's just what we see with good oral drugs. With the integrases, that's what we see, 90%. And are we ever gonna get better than that? I'm not sure, because human beings, uh, being human beings, uh, are not perfect. And you can see here the virological response uh, for the eight week was a, a little bit less than uh, the four week and the, and the oral, and, and here's in, uh, no virological data in the window. But when you actually look at uh, um, the eight-week versus the oral, or the four-week versus the oral, you can see that they're, they're comparable. So actually, it's really a good proof of concept uh, phase 2b study. And if you want to have a look at the re uh, other problems, which is the adverse events, most of them were injection site reactions. So there's another thing you've got to learn, ISR. Uh, for those of us from the T20 era, we learned ISR very quickly. Uh, but 99% of ISRs with injectable, but most of them were just grade 1. And none were grade 4, OK? And you got some pain. Uh, rarely to, to have nodules, that's important, actually, not to develop nodules, and, of course, some swelling. And less than 1% withdrew. So, actually, having 2 to 3 mils every 4 weeks or every 8 weeks was very well tolerated. Uh, and um, total adverse events leading to withdrawal, in the, in, if you pull those two arms, 4% versus 2%. So, it's what you see in oral treatment range, around about 2 to 5% two to of people drop out. So, it's very similar, giving IM to giving oral. And if you want to look at the 96-week data, it's, pretty, it's still pretty good. We always get some dropouts later on. Uh, and the dropouts between 48 and 96, uh, uh, three people withdrew consent. So with those people, they don't have to give a reason. They just say, I don't want to carry on. And there may be many reasons for that. Okay, and in the CABA oral arm, again, all three uh, withdrew consent. But no really um, protocol defining virological failures. So once you got undetectable at 48 weeks, you stayed undetectable, and 88% of people were satisfied. And now that they're moving now into phase three, of course, and these are some of the names of the studies to look out for. I don't have that data. Now, they did do some patient acceptability, and basically, very satisfied is the highest number here in the yellow, and very dissatisfied, you sort of go down from yellow all the way down to green. And you can see most people, majority of people, were uh, on a six or a five score in terms of satisfaction. And how satisfied would you be continue a present form of treatment? Again, they liked it. Now, let me just say something about these questionnaires. It all looks great, but remember, when you go into a clinical trial, you volunteer. Ah, oh, yeah, I want to go on that injection, okay? So they're not a group of people you say to, I want to give you an injection, I think it's best for you because of all your problems or something else. That is a very different group. So these people uh, who go into a clinical trial know exactly what they're doing, they know what they, 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 they read about it, they decide they're going to take part. So I think that that's an important thing to remember about any satisfaction. We, we can't, you can't take this and say you're going to give it to the general population in terms of satisfaction score. And uh, resistance to CAB has been, found, uh, has been found, so you can get resistant to carbotegravir, and it can remain for up to one year. So the problem is twofold for this. You really need to make sure you follow the patients up, 
and, uh, and so that they don't stop, because if they stop and miss doses, they could get cabotegravir resistance. And what you don't want is to start getting transmitted resistance, uh, because these mutations might, might hang around a while. So we don't know what that's going to do. Uh, and like the real world, it's, ne you know, it's not quite the same as clinical trials. And the only way we're going to find out is that when these enter phase three, we'll see more data. And when they enter the, the public domain, we'll then have a better handle on uh, whether or not we're going to generate any resistance. Now, there's some other candidates, and you, I'm going to talk about some of these today, especially EFDA. 9131, uh, say mentioned, it's ongoing. It's got a good resistance profile, even against the, the K65R, uh, but there's some manufacturing challenges they've got. And also, there was a signal with urethereal damage in rats, so that's still going on. And I'm going to talk about uh, the capsid inhibitor uh, uh, and then a bit about ibolizumab. Hey, I actually pronounced that correctly first time <laughs> um, as well. But there's quite a lot of drugs coming, and I've probably missed some off, right? But uh, what you guys and we guys need to do now is keep a handle on these because uh, it's really interesting that a lot of drugs in phase 2B, you may learn all about them, but a lot of them don't make it to phase 3, and even some of them that get to phase 3 don't make it into clinical practice. So just keep an eye on them. You don't need to be an expert on all of these. So this is the EFDA, uh, potential for a drug in an implant. They're looking at this already uh, on Merck. So Merck likes to call it 8591. I, I, I find it easy because I know the word FDA because it means something different to me. And EFDA is really easy to remember. So it, it, and basically, when you look at these, this um, uh, virological effect, right, this is 10 milligrams. Now, why is, and that's given a weekly, uh, you can see that, just, but this is single dose, basically, in the end. It's just given once. And these are given every day, right? TAF's given every day and TDF every day. You can see it's very virological active, down to two logs. It's got low dose, and you can see the rate of decline is a bit bigger than the other than TAF and TDF. Well, okay, I don't know what that means yet. Uh, and it's probably because it's got three mechanisms of action, all right? So it's a, it's a very interesting drug. It's a transcriptase translocation inhibitor. You're probably going to hear more about it at this meeting, but actually it's got a very funny shape when it adds on, and it also binds very hard to RT, uh, and so it's it's really interesting mechanism. And um, there are these 180-day extended releases going to, uh, go, going to be um, developed, or at least looked into. I can't say it's going to end up being developed. Uh, and you can see here, again, in a bit bigger, uh, this single dose, look at the 1.78 at uh, 250 hours. And here's what you've got in the form different formulations here. You can see this is the time in days, right? Release effective drug levels for 180 days. Okay, so that's quite a long time. Imagine having uh, an antiviral that can uh, work for six months. And you can see tiny doses, even 0.25 milligrams of this thing, right, gets above, uh, these are above the, the target, PK target uh, that you need to achieve for wild type. So you can see, look at this, bigger doses will be even higher. So um, I think this is a very interesting drug. Let's see where it all goes. Um, and there's multiple dosing here, another study, so there's lots, and this is in PBMCs, which looks, uh, if you look here, the T max in PBMCs is up to a day, uh, apparent T half is about 210 hours. And again, it's what Say was saying, it, it's going to cells that maybe, you know, you want it to go to. Um, and here are all the viral load declines um, also. So it's, it looks really active. Uh, you, we might be able to see it in an implant that lasts up to six months, and uh, we, even weekly dosing uh, looks excellent. So I think that, and it's, it's a, a new form of nucleoside or nucleotide. It's a very interesting uh, drug. Now, Gilead have got this capsid inhibitor, and that works in two ways. Uh, so first of all, here's the virion coming out of the cell, okay? And it has to mature, and the, the, this GSCA1 prevents the maturation, but also when the virus, the, the, the virus goes into the cell, you need to disassemble the core to get the pre-integration complex out, and it also inhibits uh, this nuclear translocation here. So it's got a dual mechanism of action, which is really interesting for a drug. So we've got the Merck 
drug EFDA, which has got three mechanisms of action against RT, and this has got two separate actions against maturation and against this getting the pre-integration complex into the nucleus. So it's really interesting. You'd think this is a little bit like an uh, integrase in a way, but uh, anyway, it's not. And you can see here, and look, this is not human beings, so I'm sorry it's not clinical data, but I thought this is, this is coming on, and I think we're going to hear more about it. And you can see potential for monthly or longer, and this is 10 weeks out, and it's still above the EC95. So what else is coming? We talked about implantables, and what about antibodies, okay? Other people are looking at recombinant um, antivirals uh, uh, and transfecting uh, HIV, but I'm going to now talk about this antibody-based therapy. So what about monoclonal antibodies against CCR5? Now, we had Maraviroc and uh, Citrusviroc Citrus against uh, CCR5, and um, some people still use uh, Maraviroc. It's sort of the, its use has gone down a lot. Uh, now the integrases are here because we've got more choices, but it's still a useful drug, and a lot of people like to use it in the CNS. But this is monoclonal antibodies, and this is Pro140. And basically, given it intravenously, you get very good effects on um, viral load. And interestingly, the first proof of concept for self-administrable weekly or bimonthly subcutaneous administration. So that you could give yourself. Okay, and you've seen the technologies that Say was talking about that could be modified for those sorts of technologies. And here's some of the, um, the treatment groups that people have used, half a milligram per kilo up to five milligram per kilo in, in terms of the, the dosing. And some of these have been uh, up to 324 milligrams. So there's lots of different uh, uh, um, studies going on with Pro140. Let's see where it, what happens to it. And this is the, um, one of the clinical studies in art suppressed patients. So you've got 39 patients who are on suppressive art. They had to have R5 virus because it's an anti R5. It's no good giving it to people with X4. And uh, 16 continued self administration after week 13. And you can see 11 remained suppressed on Pro 140 for more than a year. Okay. Three of them had virological failure and one moved away from the study. But no antibodies to the antibody were seen. So that's good news. So that's really interesting. You, uh, you're on suppressive art, you go onto this, and you remain suppressed for more than a year on a subcutaneous injection. And there's a phase two, three trial uh, coming, and, and uh, these are people who are resistant to a drug in each of the three classes. Because again, if you, uh, um, if you can use this instead of conventional drugs, because you're resistant to many of them, uh, that's, that's great. However, having said that, uh, if I ask myself how many patients have I got who are resistant to three classes and I can't treat them nowadays, it's really small. Yeah, it's really small. But at least there's an orphan use for this, uh, this compound. Now, ibilizumab, uh, are people quite excited about this? It's, um, it binds to CD4 to prevent HIV attachment, and it's active against HIV-1, even if it's resistant to every agent. And you'd expect this from all these monoclonal antibodies, a completely different mechanism of action. And uh, the initial development was IV infusion every two weeks. Well, that's no good. <laughs> Imagine <coughs> doing that in Africa. Okay, so not pos possible. Um, anyway, it does make the viral load go down, and uh, even within a very short time, 24 weeks, 43% of patients had less than 50 copies. However, when you look at integrase and you look at the percentage of people with less than 50 copies at 24 weeks, it's almost all of them. So, okay, it's still something that might be useful. And here's um, ibilizumab in pre-treated patients. So these are people who are failing therapy. They've been on art for more than six months. They, they've uh, resistant to at least one ARV from three classes and sensitive to at least one for the OBR. So these are sort of, you know, last-ditch patients. And they're given this 2,000 two milligrams IV uh, and, um, and then onto maintenance, right, every two weeks. 53% of these patients had resistance to all drugs. So trying to do these studies, let me say, is really difficult because you've got to find all these failing patients. And, it's hard, and, and you see, there may be lots of them in uh, resource-poor countries, uh, but there aren't so many elsewhere. Uh, and anyway, this wouldn't be applicable for those. And uh, basically, when you looked at this, uh, if you look at the two log decrease, uh, the mean, mean log decrease 1.1, nobody got down to two log decrease here. And the number less than 50 copies of these people who started off with multi-drug resistant was about 60%. 
So it's very interesting compound, but as I say, I think it's got very limited use. So finally, broadly neutralizing antibodies for HIV prevention, and the, there are a lot of studies going on in this, using monoclonal ant antibodies against, again, CD4 binding sites, uh, v VRCO1, uh, and uh, there's lots of studies, look at this, 4,200, and other antibodies in development. And basically, the very interesting thing is, if you put them in combination, you get much better effects than giving them by themselves. Okay, so, um, so people are thinking that maybe you could imp in, uh, improve the potency and the breadth of action by actually giving more than one. But we end up with delivery problems again. So this is the timeline now as I finish of all of these, uh, uh, of all of these compounds. We hope 2023 for the carbotegravir rilpivirine approval, uh, maybe MK8591, EFDA, by 2024, and 9131 and the, the capsid inhibitor again about 2024, and some maybe for the monoclonals, these ones here, we might be able to get something a little bit earlier. So this is what we're looking at. It's not going to be tomorrow. We're looking at about three or four years' time before we're going to see anything really coming out. So finally, what are the key questions? Can we move away from daily oral therapy for HIV? Well, yes, in some patients, I think that we are. Are emerging long-acting therapies as effective as oral therapies? The answer to that is yes. But what do you call effective, right? In terms of viral load and side effects, yes, but maybe not toler uh, long-term tolerability, we don't know. What about toxicity? They look good. Is self-administration feasible? Only for some so far. Is it desirable? I think it is. What patients might be ideal candidates? Well, we have to choose that uh, when, we, when, we, when we evolve this whole field. And how can resistance be prevented if patients miss doses? And the only way I can think of that is to put them with something else that, they, that, that have high a genetic barrier to resistance. Otherwise, it might be difficult. And can they be used as PrEP? Well, that's my lead-in to the next talk. Thank you very much indeed.